For this week's lecture, we're going to focus on everything from Genesis chapter 12 to the very end of the Old Testament. It's a huge chunk of material to cover. Um, we're, we're talking about thousands of years of human history, according to the Bible. Uh, that's a lot of narrative to cover. Um, and so because of that, I'm not going to hit on everything. There's going to be a few things on here. You're going to be like, why did you not mention this or that? I'm just going to focus on some important key moments in the history of uh, this people group known as the Israelites that we were introduced to last week and how they came about to, to lead all the way up to will eventually be entering into the first century related to the narrative of Jesus in next week's lecture. So, so we're covering a lot of ground today and leading everything up to right before the introduction of Jesus. So, um, so let's get started. Before we dive into the main content of this lecture, let's just go ahead and cover a few recap moments from the last lecture. So in the last lecture, we looked at Genesis chapters 1 through 11, which kind of sets up the background and the main setting of the entire Bible, and it really presents the main problem. So what we see is that God made the world to be full of his goodness, all right? Um, that, that God was intentional of speaking goodness in, uh, to being and that the goodness listening in return. Um, and then he makes humanity to further that goodness in relationship with him. So God blesses them. He tells them to be fruitful, multiply, and he wants them to, to be a blessing upon his creation. He wants humanity to be the special stewards and those who are made in his image to reflect him into the world. But humans are really messy creatures. And what is meant by that is we tend to mess things up more than we get things right. And that's what happens, right? Humanity messes this up, this responsibility, this purpose that they're given. And rather than being the stewards of God's creation, they become the problem preventing God's goodness furthering into the world. Like we become the very barrier and the thing that needs to be dealt with. But we see that God is gracious and he's merciful and he's long-suffering and and in that, we still see his heart to, to want to rescue um, and restore that which is broken. That he's not a God who just creates something and then just leaves the scene. But this God of the Bible, uh, he, he's made something with a purpose and he's adamant about restoring that purpose. But this requires some changes. Primarily, we recognize that it requires a new kind of humanity to step into the story. One who will listen and trust God and will be used to defeat evil at its source. And so we're going to pick up now in Genesis chapter 12 of looking at how is God going to now bring about the rescue and redemption of all of humanity and create this new kind of human being who is going to listen and trust God and be used by God to defeat evil at its source. All right, so in this PowerPoint, we're going to try covering a lot of ground. We're going from Genesis chapter 12 all the way to the very end of the Old Testament. It's a lot of real estate to cover, okay? But I think this is going to be really interesting, and I'm going to just hit on the highlights. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so what exactly is the Old Testament? Well, the Old Testament is also known as the Hebrew Bible. It's the Bible of the days of Jesus, so to speak. And in it is a collection of 39 books that covers roughly close to 2,000 years of history. It's covering a lot of details, and it's only really hitting the highlights in itself, right? And it's a mixture of different styles of writing. So you've got the Pentateuch, also known as the Torah, which counts as the first five books of the Bible, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, you've got the history narrative. That's books like uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and First and Second Chronicles, and Joshua and Judges, and all that. You've got poetry literature like the Book of Psalms and Proverbs, and then you've got all these prophets like Jeremiah and Isaiah and uh, Micah and Malachi and all of them. And they're all really telling one big story that actually references itself a lot. It's like a giant spider web, and, and it's really hard sometimes to, to understand what's going on because the uh, things will allude to other things. So you see this especially in the poetry and the prophet sections, which are very much a pointing back to uh, things that happen in the Pentateuch. Um, or uh, you find um, in the history narratives or... Um, or um, uh, you know, even in the Torah, uh, things are 
or crisscrossing and pointing forwards and pointing backwards. You know, for instance, in the book of Genesis, you get this account where um, it's pointing ahead to the time when they're going to be slaves in Egypt. Um, and that kind of tells us that this was probably written after um, their time in uh, uh, slavery. So now the Old Testament also serves as the backdrop of the New Testament, so, which is really important because to fully understand the New Testament, we have to understand the setting and how we got to where we were. And so um, while we oftentimes don't like to read the Old Testament because we usually prefer the New Testament, it's important that we do understand what the, New Te the Old Testament is saying because we can't fully understand what the New Testament is saying until we understand the Old Testament. Um, now, the authors of the Old Testament are, uh, some of them we know for sure, are Moses, David, and Solomon. Um, there's a lot of debate on some of them. There's mystery on uh, who wrote certain books, um, like the Book of Judges is an example, or just a lot of mystery on who wrote the Book of Judges. Um, some books we know for sure who they were written after because um, they have the same name as the individual. So, uh, Jeremiah is believed to be ran by the prophet Jeremiah, for instance, and Isaiah and uh, Zephaniah and, and things like that. You, you got these prophets, so their books are kind of named after themselves. Uh, now, these authors um, are all collaborating together to tell this story. Remember, this story takes place over 2,000 years in history, and as time goes on, uh, these individuals would rise up and write new elements of the story. Um, and what they're doing is they believed that God's spirit was guiding everything that they wrote, but in their own words, right? So what's meant is that God kind of spoke to these authors, to his people, and he entrusted them to the, write this down in their own style. So that's why you have some uh, writers who write in poetry, some who write in uh, prose, some who write in the form of narrative. But basically, they're trying to communicate History and the story of God and what God has laid on their hearts as his spirit has spoken to them, and they're trying to communicate it in their own uh, format and style. Uh, now, a lot of this is, uh, there's a lot of prophetic interpretation of Israel's history, examining God's purpose for rescuing all of humanity. So what's important in that is the purpose by the Old Testament. It's not just trying to tell us the history of what happened. It's presenting to us a spiritual interpretation of that history, showing us God's ongoing purpose to rescue all of humanity, right? So we can look at other historical documents that say these certain things happen in history. We might look at it and be like, why in the world is this not being recorded in the Bible? Why is this like, this seemed to be a really important thing and the Bible doesn't talk about it. And it's because the Bible is presenting to us a prophetic interpretation of the Israel's history. It's not presenting every little thing that happened, but it's presenting what the authors think are significant to us understanding that this story of God is continuing to take place. Because really the Bible's main focus is not to tell us the historical um, elements of Israel, though it does do that. Its main purpose is to show us the ongoing narrative of God's rescue. That begins with one single family, with one guy named Abraham, and it extends out to his descendants onward and onward of this promise that we're going to look at here in a little bit, of God wanting to work through centuries and generations of uh, descendants uh, through this insignificant people group to bring about a rescue and redemption of all of humanity, right? Um, and so this is a, a work that leads itself all the way up to the birth of Jesus um, that we're going to cover in the next week's lecture. Where we left off last week when we were looking at Genesis chapters 1 through 11 is that we saw humanity kind of turn itself uh, from rebelling against God to actually being uh, an enemy of God, trying to wage war against God. And it's a really depressing ending when we come to the end of chapter 11. But when we turn to chapter 12, we see that God now takes a different approach in how he's going to rescue humanity. So before we kept constantly trying to, to get through to humanity who he was and calling them back to him and they kept refusing to listen. Now God is, rather than trying to speak to all of humanity, he kind of zones in on one particular guy named Abram, who we later get to know as Abraham. And maybe you've heard the story of Abraham. 
and all. So Abraham becomes a really big deal in the Bible because God kind of speaks one-on-one -on -one with him, and he basically promises him that he's going to, to build something brand new, this new humanity that we've been looking forward to, that, that we recognize that's needed. God kind of tells him, hey, I'm going to build it through you. All right, and so this is very important, and so let's go ahead and read it. So Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, begins saying, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, there's a lot going on there. So, so Abram, in this story, he's actually found in Babylon. And so God goes to this place of corruption, and he calls a man out of it. He says, leave this place behind and listen to me and trust me. And Abraham does. Abraham leaves behind everything. He listens to God when God speaks to him. And it's really important. Remember, we've looked at that last week, that when God speaks, it's expected that he would listen or that humanity would listen. So Abraham listens. Because what God is telling him, he's like, hey, I want to build this new family out of you. And I'm going to turn you into a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great. Right. So when humanity beforehand in chapter 11, we're like, hey, let's make a name for ourselves. Let's exalt ourselves. Right. Here, God is choosing instead who he wants to exalt rather than letting humanity exalt themselves. Right. And so God decides. I'm going to exalt one guy. I'm going to lift him up, and he's going to be a blessing. And through him, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, remember, that word blessing has been something that's been a reoccurring thing so far in the story. And it has to do with God wanting to bring his life and his goodness into the world. And that He was, we were entrusted as human beings to, to carry forward that blessing, that God blessed us and said, go and be a blessing. But, but humanity hasn't been that. But here's where God is saying, hey, I'm going to bring God, my goodness and life back into the world, Abraham, through you. So God makes this big promise that he's going to turn Abraham into a great nation. He's going to make Abraham's name great. And, and Abraham is going to be a steward of bringing in God's blessing back in the world. So it's, it's a really big deal. This is God basically saying, I'm going to bring about my rescue. And it's not going to be like how it was with Noah. It's going to be the start of something incredibly new, something unheard of. Now, we might be sitting there thinking, man, Abraham must have been a great guy. Man, he must have been the, the pinnacle of uh, morality and, and just a wonderful dude to have this promise. But what's funny about this is the moment that God tells him this and Abraham's like, yeah, sign me up for this project. I want to be part of this. Well, we find that Abraham goes into Egypt and he immediately shows himself to be a coward. He goes around uh, saying, man, I've married a wife who's smoking hot. She's just out of my league and people are going to kill me to have her. And so he tells his wife to tell everyone that uh, she's his sister. Right. It's kind of embarrassing and sad and not a good marriage tactic whatsoever in this world. Like that's not recommended to go and tell your spouse, hey, tell everyone I'm your sibling, right? Uh, but that's what Abraham does, and it's really embarrassing. Like, this is the dude who is going to be used by God to build a great nation out of and bring about the blessing of the world, and here he is. He's embarrassed for marrying a wife out of his league, right? Uh, but what we see in this is that God rescues Abraham from his own um, ignorance and idiocy, um, and the mistakes he makes, and that God continues to uh, bless Abraham and make promises to him. In fact, when we turn to chapter 15 of uh, the story of Genesis, we find that here's Abraham. He's reaching uh, an older age. He has no children. He's kind of depressed, saying, you know what? No one's, uh, who's this going to be the son of mine that God has promised, who's going to be my great descendant, who's going to be this nation that God is promising to be born to me? And I, I don't even have any children, right? But in chapter 15, you know, as Abraham is just pleading this case before God, God speaks to him, right? And he tells him in chapter 15 that his servant's not going to be his heir, the one he thought he was going to be heir. Uh, but he, he tells Abraham, he says, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your offspring be. 
right? So here's God. He makes this covenant promise. When a covenant is a unbreakable promise in the eyes of God. We looked at that last week with Noah. And he makes this covenant with Abraham. He says, Abraham, you are going to have a descendant of your own. You're going to have a son one day. His name's going to be Isaac. And through Isaac, Isaac will have more kids. And then, and then those kids will have kids. And one day, a great nation will be born of you that will be uh, uncountable. And what's important is how Abraham responds to this. It's in verse 6, and it says, And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And so God makes this promise to Abraham, and Abraham's response is that he trusts God. And because of that, he's marked right with God. And that's unique, because up to the story, no one has been marked right with God. No one has been in a good standing with God, because humanity hasn't been trusting God. But here's Abraham. He's given this promise, and he's been carrying it forward for years. See, at moments he doubted it, but at the end of the day, he still has this trust. He's like, you know what? God has spoken to me, and I'm going to continue to listen. And so he goes forward with the story with this new title that's now put upon him that, that he's in a, a right standing with God, something that humanity hasn't seen so far in the story. And so this is a rather dramatic uh, moment for the narrative going forward and the, the identity of this family of God. So we find that God keeps his promises. And so Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob reproduces like a bunny, and he has 12 sons and um, daughters as well. Uh, but he favors really one son. It's a son, it's his 11th son named Joseph. And after the Jacob story, the story in the book of Genesis really follows this Joseph character. And Joseph goes from being this favored son who's kind of a brat to his older brothers. And they end up uh, basically selling him as a slave to Egypt. And so he ends up as a slave. And he ends up as a, uh, in service to the Egyptians uh, in a land far from his family. His uh, father, Jacob, thinks that he's dead. The brothers kind of cover it up. Uh, when years go by, Joseph's a slave. Um, some shady things happen. He ends up then as a prisoner. Um, and then eventually um, he ends up as the second over Egypt and then ends up saving Egypt, right? And saving all the surrounding Israel. It's this remarkable story uh, from brat to slave to prisoner to second e over Egypt uh, to being the savior of Egypt. And it's this remarkable story uh, that I encourage you to read. But in it, towards the end, there's this moment where Joseph has this uh, encounter with his brothers. So remember, his brothers are the ones who took him, sold him into slavery when he was a little boy um, because he was a brat. Um, it's like the worst sibling rivalry ever. Um, and then they, they come at one point needing food. They go to Egypt uh, to get food. Uh, there's a big famine in the land. No one's got food except for Egypt. Um, and they find Joseph there. And then um, at first they're terrified, but then there's this beautiful moment of reconciliation of um, the family brought together and how uh, you get this picture of how God has been working through the scenes of Joseph's life to uh, not only save Abraham's uh, family and the descendants of them, but also use them to, to be a blessing to others, right? So remember, Abraham's family was had this purpose that if they trusted God, that they would be a blessing to all the nations. And so we get to see that a little bit in the story of Joseph, where here he is, he's trying to trust this God, and in it... Uh, or by through that, he ends up becoming this blessing to all the other nations because he becomes this kind of a wounded victor in some ways where he's been wounded, he's been hurt, but through the position he's in, he is presented with this opportunity to save the lives of others, to be the savior. And, and when he has this moment with his brothers after his own father dies and they're afraid, man, Joseph's going to now kill us. Dad's gone. You know, so maybe Joseph has been waiting around to, to get revenge until dad's gone. So his inheritance wouldn't be uh, squandered, you know, so that they come to him begging and pleading that, that he would have mercy on them. And Joseph says something rather important. It's kind of the, the main verse thesis, main point, whatever you want to call it of the book of Genesis and something really important. It's in chapter 50, um, verse 20, uh, where Joseph looks at his brothers and he says, you know, hey, don't be afraid. Um, I'm not going to get revenge. And he goes on, he says, as for you, 
You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And, and that's kind of the main thesis of the book, where we've seen so far in the book of Genesis and the origin stories of humanity in accordance with the Bible, that humanity has a way of just kind of breeding chaos and evil and destruction rather than the goodness and blessing that they're intended to do. But we still see how God is working in spite of that to still bring about goodness, that he isn't stopped by evil, but he can always turn things around. So that's an important element that the story is trying to tell us of who is this God and what's his story? He's a God who works in spite of the evil around us. He's also a God that we see in this narrative, it's rather important to understanding the story, that he uses imperfect people to further his perfect plans. That this is a God who invites uh, Abraham, and then he invites Isaac, and then he invites Jacob, and then he invites Joseph and the sons, um, the other uh, brothers of Joseph, uh, to be part of this plan that God is trying to bring about a new humanity through them. And they're pretty imperfect. They're pretty terrible human beings, if you look at it. Like, these are not the cream of the crop. This is the bottom of the barrel. And yet we're seeing here's this the story that's all about God and how he's using, he's choosing to use these imperfect people to further his perfect plans. And that's going to be important for the rest of the Bible because the people in the Bible are rather terrible human beings. And, and yet we're seeing here's this God who's working in spite of them, right? But we're also seeing that this family, they're at their best when they choose to trust God rather than to trust themselves, okay? Um, and so when they choose to trust themselves, they destroy one another, they hurt one another. And that's kind of supposed to be this echo of what the Bible seems to be saying about humanity, that when we trust ourselves, when humanity trusts themselves, bad things happen. But when humanity chooses to trust uh, the God and creator, according to the Bible, that the best of versions of themselves come out. So as the book of Genesis starts to end, it leads us into what's going to be the book of Exodus by pointing out a couple of different things that happen. So this family um, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Joseph, they all move away from this promised land that God had told them, hey, one day you're going to inherit a land that becomes known as Israel in later days. Uh, they leave that land behind their home to move into Egypt. Uh, because Egypt was the only place that had food and water and that was prospering during this big famine that was going across the Middle East. And so they all moved there and they all start to reproduce like rabbits. And in, before long, this little family of uh, insignificant people turn into a rather large body of people. And they become a, a group that's large enough to be their own nation. And it's seen as a threat. So what we see in history and in the book of uh, Exodus is that Egypt um, and their pharaoh forget about Joseph and all he did to save them. And they start to see that this people group is a threat. Uh, they're, they're becoming such a large people group. They live by different cultures and customs. Um, they could one day try to attack us and ruin our culture and all that stuff. And it's out of fear that Egypt invades uh, the little town and little land that this family owned. And they, they capture them they turn them into slaves and so that's an important element because when we turn to the book of exodus we pick up hundreds of years after the story of abraham isaac jacob and joseph and we find that this family group has become known as israel and they're living as slaves and it's a really depressing moment but they have this hope that they've been caring for, that God is still going to use them. He's going to rescue them one day. He's going to bring them to the promised land. And in that setting, God is going to bring about the rescue of all humanity. It's what they've been promised through Abraham. Uh, and they also have a couple other promises that are given to them. For instance, Jacob, when he's about to die, he brings in all 12 of his sons in the room and he starts pronouncing over them different promises about their future. And he promises one of his sons named Judah that from the line of Judah, there's going to be a king who will rise up and he will rule all of the other nations. And that's kind of an important thing. That's going to be a theme that's going to come up a little bit later. Basically, what we're seeing is here's God. He's already pronouncing that one day there's going to be some special king who's going to rise up who will uh, bring about this rescue. So we're kind of honing in a little bit on who's this wounded victor going to be. 
well, he's going to be of the line of Judah. He's going to be of this family line. So we're going to start looking for this king who's going to rule over God's people and all that. But for the time being, they have to put up with a really terrible human being who now is ruling over them. His name's Pharaoh. Um, we don't know which Pharaoh it was. Um, there's a lot of historical debates on it. But basically from the story that we're about to uh, read in the book of Exodus and that the video that we're going to see on the next slide is going to show us. He's kind of a terrible human. I, I like to think of him as like this King George from that uh, Hamilton uh, play, if you've ever seen that. I mean, like this guy, is, he's all about himself. He's all about exalting himself and how great he is and enslaving and hurting uh, this people group who just want to try to listen and follow what God says. So uh, let's turn to the next slide and we can watch the video that's going to summarize everything about this. As we move from the book of Genesis, we come to a very famous story in the Bible, probably one of the most well-known and famous stories. It's a story that you're probably familiar with, um, especially if you grew up in the Bible Belt. It's a story of how this little insignificant group of people known as Israel, who were slaves in Egypt, have this mass exodus from Egypt in a, a showing of supernatural events and power that happens. It's a story that, that you might be familiar with because Hollywood makes a lot of movies of it. In the past, they at least did. Stories like the Prince of Egypt story. It's a story about how this people group, who are the descendants of Abraham, they reproduce, they grow into a people known as Israel, and they end up uh, enslaved. And so the book of Exodus begins with a rather important statement. It's one that alludes all the way back to the promise of Abraham, also to uh, the very promise God gave humanity um, when he first created them. It's in chapter 1, verse 7, and it reads that the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now remember, this is the promise that God gave Abraham, that his descendants would be more numerous than the, the stars in the sky and that there'll be a blessing to all the other nations. We've already seen one uh, snippet of the blessing aspect in the story of Joseph, but now we're seeing how this other promise is being fulfilled. Where here goes Abraham, his old man, he has children, his children have children, and so on and so on. And now they're this massive nation who have this promise that one day God is going to work through them to bring about a wounded victor who's going to bring about this uh, king of the line of Judah who's going to fix the world. And so they're kind of hoping for this to happen one day, but it doesn't look like it's happening anytime soon. Because they're not in the promised land. They're not a blessing to the world. Rather, instead, they're slaves. Because the ruler of Egypt, uh, one who is given this title of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is a title, it's not his name. Um, we're not told which Pharaoh this is. But he rises up, and it's at a time when the people were worshiping Pharaoh as a living God, right? And so this is a man who has exalted himself to the place of God. And we've seen enough in this narrative of the Bible to know that that doesn't go well. Think back to the story of the Tower of Babel, when humanity tried to exalt themselves to the place of God, saying, we're going to make a name for ourselves. This does not go well. So here's this guy. He rises up to power. He exalts himself as a God. He's being worshipped by his people as a God. He enslaves the Israelites. He starts to basically torture them for a very long time. And these people start crying now. They're like, God, won't you please come and save us? And so God calls out from their midst a guy named Moses. And Moses is rather unique. He grows up actually in the household of Pharaoh. Uh, and God kind of raises him up out of that and, and calls him to be his special servant to go back to Pharaoh and, and give the pronouncement that God wants his people to be freed. And in this exchange that Moses has with God, Moses asks God, like, who do I tell people that sent me? Who, who is the one who's sending me? And this is a rather special moment in the narrative. Because in that day and age, when people worship deities, they all worshiped a plurality of deities that all related to a particular element that the person was uh, in charge of. So you've got the God of the Nile, you've got the God of the harvest, the God of the sun, things like that. Here's God, when he gives his name, he's, he's basically pronouncing what he's the God of. And his name is Yahweh, and it translates as, I am who I am. 
And so in that singular statement of his name, God is declaring, I am the God that is over all that there is. I am the top dog. I am the only one. I am the only one who has full authority over all things in this world. He's the only true God. That's what he's claiming in that moment. It's a radical statement because monotheism was not around that area. It was all about a plurality of worship of a plurality of gods. But here is this guy who's making a statement saying that all other gods are false and he's the only one and that he's going to go to war to rescue the people that he has made this promise to through Abraham. And so he goes and sends Moses and Moses goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh uh, doesn't want uh, the Israelites to be released, even though Moses gives that awesome speech of saying, God says, let my people go, right? Uh, Pharaoh doesn't want it. So God starts to bring about all these plagues that happen uh, upon Egypt. Now, these plagues are rather unique because every single one of them is targeting a particular deity that Israel, um, not Israel, that Egypt worshipped. So you've got the Nile, the Nile River that was their source of life. And so God attacks that, he turns it into blood. You've got frogs that the Egyptian worshipped, which was a sign of, it was this fertility god. And what does God do? Well, he covers the land with frogs so that everywhere they go, everywhere they step, there's a frog right there. And it's just in their way. It's, it's this big nuisance. And there's multiple other plagues. There's 10 of them total. And each one of them was connected to a particular deity where God was basically declaring war against the Egyptians' thoughts of belief and the way they thought the world worked. And here's God coming in and saying, there's a completely different way. You're totally wrong. And every single one of them had this particular statement that God was trying to get across. We see an example of it in Exodus chapter 7, verse 5, where God kind of gives the reasoning behind all these plagues. He does it every single time he declares it per leg. He says this statement over and over. So in verse 5 of chapter 7, we read in the book of Exodus that the Egyptians, this is God talking, he says, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. And so here's this God, Yahweh. He wants all creation to acknowledge him as king this is not just a factual knowledge of okay there's a god named yahweh out there this is about a truth that brings about a response so here's this god he wants all of creation to submit to his authority and his understand or his declaration as the sole king of the universe now pharaoh doesn't like this all right so there's this narrative of pharaoh's heart getting hard now, the video we just watched, I think, did an excellent job explaining what that's about. So here's this guy. He's exalted himself in the place of God, and he's getting his power and control being challenged by a force that he does not respect. And so in the beginning, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. He's like, I don't want to have anything to do with this God. I'm not going to listen to him. And then eventually, even though God keeps pleading through Moses over and over again, that he would come to see and acknowledge Yahweh's position of authority, Pharaoh doesn't listen. And so God eventually starts to harden Pharaoh's heart. And that seems a little bit uncomfortable. But what's happening is God is constantly showing mercy and grace to evil. But when evil refuses to uh, subject itself to God, then God's going to lead evil into its own destruction. And that's kind of an important uh, theme of how God handles evil. That's going to carry through the rest of the Bible. And so these 10 plagues happen, um, and then Pharaoh eventually gets to the point where he releases the Israelites. He's like, I'm done with you. Get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. And as the Israelites pack up and they're leaving town, Pharaoh changes his mind. Uh, he chases after them with all of his army. Um, it forces the Israelites. They have to walk through the Red Sea as God splits the Red Sea in half. They walk through on dry ground, and then as the Egyptians' army tries to follow. The Red Sea comes crashing down upon them, and they all drown. And it's a terrible story for the Egyptian side of things. But for the Israelites, it's a moment where they're recognizing this God, Yahweh, has stepped in. He has rescued us. He has claimed us as his own. He's redeemed us. In fact, they break out into song in chapter 15 where they give this song celebrating all that has happened and at the very end of the song they say something that's rather unique for understanding the rest of the narrative and what's going to happen next it's in chapter 15 verse 18 where they declare uh 
the Lord will reign forever and ever. And so here in this moment, they're recognizing that God, Yahweh, is their sole king because he has defeated evil. He has rescued a people from self. And in that, he has the authority to rule over their lives. And that's going to be really important for what happens in the last half of the book of Exodus. The first portion of the book of Exodus might be the more popular one because it has the most supernatural action, most movie quality elements to it. But the first half is all about how does God rescue a people for himself? The second half of the book of Exodus is all about how do the rescued people of God live in the world now in this new status, in this new identity which they're given. And so we're seeing that, that God leads them to a place called uh, the Mountain of Sinai, and there he enters into this special covenant with them. He makes this promise to them, and he initiates it in chapter 19 of the book of Exodus, verses 4 through 6, which reads like this. God tells them, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So he reminds them, he's like, you saw how I rescued you. And here's what he asked them. He says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, which remember, we know from the creation narrative that God is someone who speaks and creation listens to him. And this is a dynamic of the relationship he wants to have with us, right? And so he says, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So God makes this promise to them. He's like, if you guys will obey me and trust me from here on out, I'm going to make you my special treasured people among all the nations. You're going to be a kingdom of priests. And you are going to be the one the promise of God is going to come through. That's what he means when he says kingdom of priests, right? You're going to be the ones who are going to be um, what humanity was supposed to be. You're going to be used as the vessel and the means by which the rest of the world is going to be fixed and restored back into a relationship with God. And by that, the world and all its evil will be fixed, right? And so here's this God. He's expressing this desire to the people. And they respond saying, yes, we want to be in this relationship. So God gives them some laws. He gives them, in fact, 613 laws about how they should live as the rescued people of God. And it was all about how they would need to be people of justice and generosity that would represent the character of God as the new humanity upon the world. And God asked for their faithfulness to this. And he promises that he's going to be faithful on his end, even, even if they're unfaithful. But he still urges them of saying, you have to be faithful to this to some degree. Otherwise, there's going to be some consequences. Now, in this, we also see another unique element of what God asked them. So God also asked for them to build what's known as a tabernacle, which is this very special tent-like structure. There's a photo on it in the, the slide, a little artistic drawing of it. And it's this special space where... Humanity could come and dwell with God, right? It's a really special location. And it shows us this heart of this God. We see that in Exodus chapter 29, where he tells us in verse 45, he says, I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So this is a God who wants to dwell with his people where they listen and obey him. We see that all the way back in the Garden of Eden. In fact, that's what the tabernacle was supposed to represent, that in this space, they get to witness what the Garden of Eden, what creation and the relationship between God and humanity was supposed to look like, where God dwelled with his people, where he wanted to be in the room with them. And in this, they would listen and obey him. They would be in this deeply intimate relationship with their their creator that's what god is wanting them so he, he's making this promise that he's going to look out for them that he wants them to be his rescued people not just from egypt but from the entire world so god enters into this special relationship known as a covenant with israel and israel agrees that saying hey we want to live up to what God asks of us, we want to be his special people. We want to be used by God to be part of his process of fixing the world. It seems really awesome, right? And so because they agree with this relationship, 
They send Moses up on this mountain to meet with God so that he can get written down all the laws that God wants him to follow of what it means to be a people of justice and generosity. And meanwhile, Israel just kind of goes down the toilet. Um, it's really depressing. Moses is only up there for um, about a month and they just totally lose hope. They think Moses is dead. Um, and so they immediately look to, to return to Egypt. They look to make new idols for themselves. Um, it's a really depressing moment. And it basically shows them that the hardness of the heart wasn't just in Pharaoh, it was in them. They're looking just like Pharaoh. They're trying to exalt themselves to the place of God. They're, they're trying to, uh, in a moment of doubt and panic, not trust God, not trust the God who just ra uh, rescued them, but they're trying to do things on their own. And so because of their failure, there's uh, several consequences that come about. Uh, so God um, comes in. He's angry. He wants to give up on them. Moses convinces him not to. Um, but the people who led those into the sin of building a golden calf and all that, they get punished. It's, it's a big massacre, a lot of death. Then they go to the borderland. After following God's direction through the wilderness, they get to the borderland of the promised land. They're ready to enter it in, but they don't trust that God is going to rescue them. This God who brought about all the ten plagues and rescued them from Egypt, they're at the gates and they're thinking, man, this God, Yahweh, he's not going to fight our battles. He's not going to get rid of the enemy that's in our land. So let's just can go back. And they once again, they think about going back to Egypt. And God has to punish them, and he prevents them from being allowed to enter into the promised land for 40 years. And so for 40 years, they wander around aimlessly through the wilderness, just waiting for an entire generation of their people to die off and for a new generation to be born who will trust Yahweh, who will listen and obey Yahweh, and then go into this promised land. But in this 40-year journey, we find that everyone is kind of messing up, including Moses. Even Moses fails to trust his God, and because of that, he's not allowed to enter into the promised land. And that's really depressing, because Moses was like this priest, prophet, king. He was this super awesome dude who was leading Israel. Um, you know, he performed miracles. Um, he was just a really awesome dude. But he, even he's not allowed to enter in the promised land, because he has failed to listen and to love this God, to, to obey in a voice of love for this God. And so Moses is about to die and he selects a new guy named Joshua to take over. And he gives this uh, big prediction of the future. He talks about how Israel is going to continue to fail. And one day they're going to lead themselves into exile. It's how the Old Testament actually ends. And he's predicting, he's like, this is what's going to happen to you. You guys are going to fail to listen and to um, obey what this God has to say. You're going to fail to love him, and it's going to lead to consequences because you're not going to be who you're meant to be. You're, you're going to become like everyone else. You're going to become just as much a problem as everyone else. But Moses also gives this message of hope that one day God will change the hearts of his people and make a way for them to truly listen and love God. But then Moses dies right outside the promised land. And the book of Deuteronomy records it for us. And it says something rather important at the very ending of the book. It says this in chapter 34, verse 10, that there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and the wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. So basically it ends, the Torah ends with the statement of there has never been anyone like Moses since Moses. And it's really meant to be kind of this question that's brought up there of we need a new Moses to lead us into this new land. That's what's being told to the people as they're reading the story. And it's, it's rather unique because it kind of pictures all these other themes that we're looking for. Okay, So we're looking for this wounded victor who will destroy evil by mutual self-destruction. We're looking for this guy who's going to be born of the line of Judah, who's going to be the king of all the nations. And we're looking for someone who's going to be a new and better Moses. And that's important because the Old Testament is going to continue tracking this, looking for this special individual. Once the Israelites enter the land known as the Promised Land, the land that eventually becomes known as Israel, uh, we get into the story known as Joshua. Uh, 
So Joshua is uh, a book named after a guy named Joshua, and Joshua was the next guy in charge. So he's uh, the second command to Moses, which you can imagine is rather intimidating. He just watched Moses do all these amazing things, and yet Moses has dealt with this really stubborn, stiff-necked people. And you can imagine he's probably thinking, man, I do not want to be leading these people. Or at least that's what I'd be thinking, right? But that's what Joshua has stepped into, and he leads his people into this promised land, and it's a long narrative of conquest and battle about trying to take the promised land from uh, the people who were already living there at the time. And he succeeds because it's told to us that he's just like Moses in the fact that he listens and he loves God and he meditates on God's word day and night, which in that day and age was just the Torah, it's just the first five books of the Bible, from Genesis to the book of Deuteronomy. But he reads it constantly. He's seeking to listen to love God. He's a, a great guy, but he too fails to be this promise deliverer that we're really looking forward to because the heart of the people have not changed. They're still broken. They're still um, corrupt. And we see that so clearly when we get to the very next book of the book of Judges. The book of Judges picks up right when Joshua has died and the people have taken over the land, they've settled in, they've set up homes and stuff like that, and there's really no successor. There's no government in place. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing, and it's a story of anarchy. But the book of Judges also follows how these individuals rise up, known as judges. They're not in the sense that we think of judges today of a courtroom, but these are the, these warriors who come up in times of need and they fight for their people. But the book of Judges is a really depressing story. Like I said, it's all about anarchy. It's all about showing here's the people that God wants to use to fix the world, and they're seen to be just as bad as everyone else. We see that in chapter 2 of the book of Judges where it says, The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and they served the Baals. And they abandoned Yahweh, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked Yahweh to anger. They abandoned Yahweh and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. And so God had told them that they weren't to have any other gods but him. But they were like, yeah, we're not going to do that. And so they completely abandoned God once they got what they wanted out of God. And the book of Judges follows that this long narrative of this growing corruption in the people and in their leaders. And it's a really depressing story leading all the way up to the final line of the book of Judges which says in chapter 21, verse 25, that in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And that's serving kind of as the case study. See, the book of Judges is trying to make an argument that the people, they need some sort of government over them. They're not really listening to God as their king. They're refusing to obey what God wants them to do. And when they're left on their own, they fall naturally into corruption. And so we get this story that builds from there in the book of 1 Samuel about how this last judge, a guy named Samuel, he's been trying to lead the people back to God. They reject him because they want a king. They want someone who will lead them to make them look like all the other nations around them. Now that's shocking because they were never meant to look like everyone else. But, but they want a king over them. And so we're told in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, Verse 4 says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people and all that they say and do. And here's the really heartbreaking moment. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that I have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, they have forsake me and served other gods who they are also doing to you. So here's this moment where God just seems heartbroken. His people were supposed to be like, unlike anything else, but they want to be like everyone else. They, they refuse to listen to him. And so they've rejected God as a king. And here's this moment where God's like, okay, you want this? You don't want to be a kingdom of priests? You don't want to be a blessing upon the world? Fine, you will be like everyone else. And so he brings about for them 
a king of a guy named Saul. And things go really bad for Saul. So Israel has his first king, a guy named Saul. But Saul is not a good guy. He's uh, He doesn't listen to God. He doesn't listen to Samuel. He kind of does things his own way. Um, he gets uh, Israel in trouble a lot. Um, he's very cowardly, very angry, does not have a heart for God. And eventually he's replaced. And a new guy gets put in charge. It's David. And, and David is something completely different. He goes from this shepherd boy to defeating this giant named Goliath to being named king. And in between the Goliath and the king stage, he's also hunted by Saul. Um, so it's a, a really dramatic story through 1 Samuel of looking at the rise of this no-name shepherd boy all the way up to him becoming king at the beginning of 2 Samuel. And David is a man of, um, he's got a lot of flaws, yes, but he's got this heart that he wants to listen and obey God. He loves God. He writes, in fact, many of the books or the Psalms and the book of Psalm. Uh, he's a awesome dude. Um, and as he's king, he starts to lead the people back to God. He's born of the line of Judah. He's passionate about having um, uh, a people who will listen and love God. And I mean, you read his story and you start to think, man, this guy is the man. He's the one we're looking for. He's the one who's going to fix everything, right? Um, and he has this desire. He wants to build a house for God. He wants to build a, a temple, this magnificent temple. But God tells him something different. He says, uh, when David comes up and says, like, God, I want to build you this massive temple, God responds in chapter 7 of 2 Samuel by telling him in verse 12, where he says, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So David's like, God, I want to build you a house but God wants to build instead in David an eternal dynasty through David's line. David's like, hey, I want to build you a home. God's like, I want to build you something so great. And so this is a promise of a Messiah who's going to come after David. It's going to be one of his sons, we're told, who's going to be this promised king over all the nations who's going to be the one to set this world right and fix things, okay? So now we're honing in a little bit more. We know it's going to be the line of Judah. We know this guy's going to be like a new Moses. We know he's going to fulfill the promises of Abraham. He's going to fix the world. Now we know it's going to be someone born of the line of David. Now, before we think too highly of David, we have to remember David was an average human being, and he had a lot of flaws, and he's very famous for this moment that happens right after he's given this promise where he then goes and he has an affair with one of the wives of one of his soldiers, a man who he has known for years. He sleeps with this man's wife, then tries to cover it up when he finds out that the woman is pregnant and he has uh, the husband killed. It's a really dramatic moment of you're just looking at it and you're like, wow, this guy, he was awesome. He was great. And now he's an adulterer. He's a murderer. He's covering it up. He's thinking he got away with it, but unfortunately he doesn't. And that's uh, a good thing, actually, because we want to know that um, those who face or who do injustice, even those as good as David, will, will face justice for their crimes. And so he thinks he can get away, but this God that we looked at, the one who is all about justice and generosity and and fixing the world, he has to deal with this thing that David has done. David's actions in some way play a huge part in what leads to the civil war and division of Israel. So David has a son named Solomon, and Solomon is known as this really wise dude. Uh, everything seems to be great under Solomon, but by the end, uh, he causes even more problems. Um, that feed into the problem that David started. Um, and so the story of First and Second Kings kind of follows what happens after David, uh, starting with Solomon and then with Solomon's son, 
uh, that leads into how Israel just shatters into two different nations. They go to civil war. Um, they eventually lead into exile, um, both of the north and then eventually of the south. Uh, and it's all because all they crave, these kings, crave sex, money, and power. Um, and they completely abandon God. So you see it in Solomon where all that becomes his main priority, especially towards the end of his life. You see it in his son, and his son, like after a few weeks of being king, ends up causing this massive civil war, and so Israel splits into two nations. There's um, the northern half that's still known as Israel, and then there's the southern half that's known as Judah. Um, and it's they're constantly at war with the, one another. They're constantly trying to destroy each other. Um, Judah tries to stay committed to God. Um, every now and then they have good kings who lead revivals um, back in the people. Uh, but when you look at the north, their story in Israel, they only get worse and worse and worse. They get more and more corrupt. They don't care about listening to God. Um, and it's really a sad story. Now, in First and Second Kings, probably the only good thing that happens is uh, in the beginning when they build this massive temple. It's beautiful. It's um, elaborate. It's Unlike anything that's ever been seen, it would be one of the wonders of the earth if it was still um, alive today or if it's still um, standing today. Um, but in this moment, when God kind of um, uh, puts a blessing upon the temple, we're told in Second Chronicles that he gives this charge to them. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, he says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen. And you see that first in the nation of Israel when they refuse to listen. And then eventually the empire of Assyria comes in and just wipes them out. In fact, they're just basically erased from history. Um, they get blended in, those who survive. But Assyria just comes in and just destroys them. And then about 100 years later, we see a similar thing happen for the bottom nation, the nation of Judah, when the Babylonian Empire rises up and Babylon comes marching in. And Babylon, who we should recall from our last week's lecture, looking at the Tower of Babel, they, they come in, they've exalted themselves as like top dog, they think that they're gods. They come in, they destroy Jerusalem, which is the city uh, in Judah, uh, the city of the King David, um, and they drag all the few survivors back away in chains. And here's this land, this promised land that God said he was going to work through his people in this space to bring about a new humanity and a restored world. And we've seen that the people are killed, and those who remain are dragged from their homes in chains to foreign lands. It's a really depressing ending to uh, the grand narrative of the Old Testament. So the story of Israel and God comes to a really traumatic moment when the people who are supposed to be partnering with God and be used by God to, to bring about this restoration and rescue of all of humanity, they find themselves part of the problem in fact that they turn away from god and so the story in like the the books of first and second kings and first and second chronicles tracks this ongoing progression of the israelites when they they're trusting these kings of theirs who only lead them more and more into darkness and despair they um it's like the story of judges all over again um in fact it's the, primarily the story of the book of genesis chapter 11 all over again if you recall, we looked at that story and we, we talked about this Tower of Babel or Tower of Babylon, where here was this moment where humanity starts to exalt themselves in the place of God. They said, we don't want anything to do with God. We want to remove God from our story. We want to be in charge. Um, we want to make a name for ourselves. And we're seeing this happen all over again, where this people group who were supposed to be the solution to this problem find themselves doing the exact same thing. And then where they end up? Well, they end up exiled from the promised land and in Babylon. It's a really tragic moment. It's a replay of Genesis chapter 11 all over again. But what's important to know is that the story isn't over. 
Well, it's hit this major roadblock that seems like the end of the story. I mean, here are the people who are supposed to be the heroes who have turned into the villains. They're removed from their land and they've lost all their blessings. It seems like this is a end of the road experience. We still see how God has been working through this, through all this narrative, and he continues to promise salvation to them. He continues to promise that one day their rescue is going to come about by this promised king and messiah one who's going to be better than all their former kings he's going to be the one who's going to have a love for god that's greater than what david had he's going to have a wisdom greater than solomon he's going to trust for god greater than abram the narrative of the old testament keeps talking about this messiah this pinnacle of all of humanity who's going to be the one who's going to rescue israel and by a rescued israel therefore going about rescuing the whole world now this story of the old testament or the hebrew bible this majority of the the book uh, of the old testament was arranged during the time when israel was in exile and that's important because it's written to remind the people of how they ended up there but also to give them hope that the god that they worship while they have failed they have lacked faithfulness for the merits of what this god wanted for them the god that they worship has remained faithful to them and that he's going to provide a future king that they need to be looking for who's going to rescue them from exile so the story from here on out kind of looks to who is going to be this individual who's going to rescue humanity so for this lecture, for the uh, paper that you had to write for this one, we looked at passages like Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, which is a very famous passage where Isaiah, he's talking to the people who are in exile and he's telling them, this is how God is going to rescue us. He's going to bring us out of exile and through our rescue, he's going to redeem us and so that we can be the solution the the victors the uh the salvation bringers the saviors of the rest of humanity and it's going to be through this wounded victor right so isaiah chapters 52 and 53 are pulling out that language that we've seen already and play a lot that this wounded victor is going to come he's going to be the messiah he's going to lead humanity back and so this is kind of where the old testament ends with this hopeful promise of one day this guy's going to come, uh, but not yet. Now, the Old Testament still has more to say about what happens when Israel's in exile and, and the state that they live in and, and what God is doing through them. And that's what we're going to turn to next in our story. So as I said in a previous slide, the story of the Old Testament does not end at the moment when Israel is removed from their land and their home and they're, they're dragged away to Babylon. But the story kind of continues, showing us this God who remains faithful to these people. So we see that in the books of Esther and Daniel, this God who is continuing to work through his people to use them to be blessings to all the nations. As he raises up people like Esther and Daniel and he puts them in positions where they're in uh, their advisors or they're um, in relationship with the governing authority and they have this influence to, to make positive impacts and a difference um, and to be a blessing upon all the nations so we get to see in the books of esther and uh daniel god's faithfulness to his promise to uh, abraham and how god is continuing to work through these people even though they continue to uh, fail him and continue to not show trust for him then we come to the books of ezra and nehemiah and these books describe where the ruling authority of the day uh, persia the emperor decides to allow the israelites to return back to their home um, and so the books of ezra and nehemiah talk about how they come back to their home and they find it destroyed and their efforts to rebuild um, ezra talks about how they rebuild their religious system and nehemiah talks about how they build rebuild their infrastructure and their buildings and their walls and everything and how they come back to some semblance of what life was like before but it's not the same kind of like in our own day and age where 2020 came and COVID hits and uh things kind of went nuts and you know we're three years out from that moment and 
and, and life is starting to come back to some semblance of normalcy that we had before him, but it's still not all the same. I mean, we've gone through things as a nation, as family members, as um, neighborhood uh, community members that have forever shaped us because of what 2020 was. And so now that we're in three years out from this moment that happened that, that rocked our world, we're having to ask ourselves the same thing. We're, we're basically experiencing our own moment of Ezra and Nehemiah where we were building, but it's never going to be the exact same. And that's the story of Ezra and Nehemiah where we see how God rebuilds, but it's a little bit different. And there's a different atmosphere in this because the people are returned to their homeland. They're able to go back to their homes that they lost beforehand, but it's different. They're not uh, independent they still have to answer to an oppressive empire that's over them for centuries. It goes from the Babylonians to the Persians to later the Greeks to eventually the Romans that's in the New Testament, where one after another, a different oppressive empire gets to come into their homes, tell them how they get to live, they get to tax them, they get to do whatever they want, and the people of God, the, these Israelites, are powerless to do anything to, to stop this from happening. So their home is not really their home. It's it's someone else's home that they're kind of renting, even though they know that they once owned it. It's a really debilitating state of life that these Israelites spend the next few centuries living under. Um, and it's important that we get that because while the exile might physically be over, the feelings of exile remain long into the days of the New Testament. And so this hope for a Messiah gets louder and louder. And it's the reason why in the days of Jesus, why there's a lot of revolutions and uh, why there's a lot of people um, before and after Jesus who also claim to be these messiahs. Because the people, they start to interpret that, man, if we can just defeat these oppressive empires, then we'll be truly free. Um, and so that's what they're hoping that the Messiah will do, um, that the, while they might physically be home, the exile still remains because they don't own their own home, right? Um, and so that's important that we understand that before we lead into next week's lecture, understanding the, the tension in the world of the New Testament that comes out of the Old Testament and these issues that last for centuries that Jesus has to walk through and navigate in. Now, as we come to the very end of the Old Testament, we have to see that there's some really big problems that the Old Testament doesn't answer. It kind of ends with like this big cliffhanger. And, it, and if you've been tracking the story carefully, you'd see that like these things have to be answered. It's what the New Testament is going to try to answer and what we're going to try to point to in the next few weeks. But let's go ahead and look at some of these problems, all right? So we see that Abraham uh, was given this promise to have many uh, descendants and that they're going to be a blessing upon the world. And while they're meant to be the solution of God to, to fix the world, they find that they're just as bad, if not worse, than the rest of the world, right? So we're looking to these people and we're seeing, hey, you're supposed to be the heroes, but they're really more of like the villains, if you think about it, because they know better, and yet they still continue to not trust this God and not do what they need to be doing, and the rest of the world is suffering rather than them being the blessing to the rest of the world that they're supposed to be. So it tells us that, you know, if God is going to save the world through Israel— then he's got to first save Israel, right? Because um, Israel is supposed to be the vehicle, the blessing that he, he's going to use to save the rest of the world. So now we're having to ask ourselves like, okay, so now the people who are supposed to be the heroes or the villains, if this God is going to keep his promise, then he's got to find some way to save Israel so that the rest of humanity can be saved as well. Another problem that we see is that God's people are incapable of listening and loving God, right? He, time and time again, we see this God keep telling them, hey, if you listen to me when I speak to you, and that if you love me and you obey me, then things are going to go well for you. You're going to be a blessing to the rest of the world. You're going to be who you're supposed to be. But we find that the people of God, their hearts are too corrupt. They're just like the Pharaoh that we looked at long ago, that, that even though God challenged Pharaoh and, and he rescued the Israelites from their slavery, we find that their hearts were just as hard and corrupt. And so we get this long narrative of God constantly trying to win them back. And we get these good moments like 
the heart of Daniel, but or not Daniel, but David, but even David messes up. And so here's these people who are incapable of listening and loving God. And so we see that God must give his people a new heart so that they can listen and love God. Like if God is going to not only save Israel, then he, he's got to, uh, if he's going to save the world through Israel, then he's got to change the heart of Israel, which means he's got to change the heart of his people so that those who are, are part of his family will have the capability of listening to what God has to say and, and living it out, of obeying it, of loving God and loving people. And the other problem we see is that the God's people, they might have returned from exile in a physical state, but they remain lost in continual state of exile as they live under oppressive forces. Like these are not a free people. They're back in a form of slavery yet again, right? And that kind of chains them, that prevents them from reaching the world, from being all that they're supposed to be, right? And so this solution we're, we're looking for is that God, he's promised to confront evil and defeat it at its source with the promised Messiah. And so this is what we're gonna kind of hit on the next slide is this big hope that's going to be the solution to all these problems that we're waiting for. And it all is going to center upon this wounded victor, this promised Messiah, this one who's going to be of the lineage of David, of the tribe of Judah. He's going to be bigger and better than Moses. And he is going to be the one that God keeps promising is going to be the solution to all of these big problems. So the Old Testament says a lot about this hope of a new king, this Messiah figure. Um, just about every single book of the Old Testament has something to say about this promised individual, this hero of the ages, who is going to uh, fulfill God's promises and save humanity. And so uh, on this slide, we're just going to give a quick recap of some of the things that we've looked at and that's important for us to understand before we lead into the New Testament and how the New Testament keeps claiming that Jesus is this Messiah. And so we need to understand what exactly does that mean? And what exactly is the job and the responsibilities of this Messiah and what they're going to accomplish? So first off, we see that this Messiah is someone who's going to fulfill the promises of Abraham. Remember the promise made to Abraham was that he's going to have a family who's going to be a blessing to all the nations. And so this Messiah is going to be the one who's going to create this never-ending family of God and this family of God will in turn be a blessing upon the rest of the world because this Messiah has brought them into this new family. And so we're, that's one role of this Messiah. Another role is that this is going to be someone who is going to be greater than Moses. Remember, we looked at Moses. He's a, a priest, prophet, king. He's this really awesome dude. He led uh, his people through the wilderness and to their new home. Um, after he was used by God to defeat evil. And so we're looking um, in the Old Testament and seeing that this Messiah is supposed to be someone who's even greater than Moses. He's going to lead his people into the home that they're supposed to be in after he has defeated the evil that has chained them up and prevented them from being who they're supposed to be. We also see that this Messiah is going to be someone born of the line of Judah and David. He's going to have a right to rule all the nations but he's going to have a love and loyalty to God that's greater than David. You know, David, remember, he had this great love for God. And, you know, we see that in the book of Psalms and things like that. But his loyalty was faulty because, you know, he still had this affair and murder and cover up. It was this big scandal, right? Like, here's this guy who we thought was going to be the Messiah. And turns out he's just as much a failure. But he, this Messiah that's promised after David is going to, have to be someone who has an like even greater love and loyalty to God, who's going to truly obey and listen to what God has to say. We also see that this uh, Messiah is going to be someone who's going to be wiser than Solomon. And, um, and Solomon was known as the wisest man who ever lived in the Old Testament, but even he failed to obey God. He, he acted foolishly, if you read his story. And so the the Messiah that's promised in the Old Testament is that this is going to be someone who's even wiser than Solomon. He's going to say things that are going to shape culture for generations after him. And we're also seeing something very important, that this Messiah is going to be someone who's going to end the cycle of exile and death and pain and suffering. And by that, that means that he's going to be someone who's going to end sin 
You see, sin was rather important in the understanding of what led to exile. And so if someone's going to end the cycle of exile, then they have to be someone who confronts sin and deals with the sin of Israel and therefore the sin of the world. So this Messiah figure is someone who's having to wear a lot of hats and is a super important individual. When we come to the end of the Old Testament and we have to ask ourselves, well, who this guy, who's it going to be? But the Old Testament doesn't answer that for us. It just builds a case of showing here's this God who is trying to rescue humanity and the people he has been counting upon, they have failed. But God has still been faithful and he's promised that from within their failure, one day a Messiah is going to come. Someone who the uh, prophet Isaiah says is going to be pierced for our transgressions, uh, wounded for our iniquities, but by his stripes we shall be healed. And so we end this lecture, I thought, what I hope is a little bit of tension of wondering who is this Messiah going to be? And for that, well, we're going to have to just wait until the next week when we look at this guy named Jesus of Nazareth who claimed to be the Messiah. And we're going to investigate to see whether or not he truly is this Messiah that's promised in the Old Testament. As we end this lecture, I want to go ahead and real briefly remind you on uh, the upcoming assignments that you have due. So you have a paper, um, uh, your weekly paper. This one's going to involve for part one, looking at Matthew chapters 26, 27, and 28. This is the passion narrative of the um, trial and execution and eventual resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah. And so you need to be looking at that. And I want you to, rather than just regurgitate what happened, I want you to express how you think this influences a Christian worldview. You can go back to the previous lecture when we broke down how a Christian worldview is made up. Um, and you can use those points to kind of analyze based on this, these chapters of Matthew, how these things uh, speak to a Christian worldview or understanding of how the world works. Um, you also, for part two, remember, you need to be looking at the complete Bible answer book. You need to look at five more chapters. Don't use five chapters you've already used um, in the previous paper. This needs to be a, a new five new chapters. And in those, you need to describe what the topic was of each chapter, uh, what was the argument, uh, whether you agree or disagree, and tell me your opinion on why. And do more than just say, I agree with this, um, and that's it. I want you to just say, hey, um, I honestly agree or disagree from this, and here's my uh, reasons why, my opinion, and how Hank described his argument and what I thought of it. Also be reading Case for Christ. I want to remind you of that again. This counts for 50% of your final grade. So that paper uh, covering this book review of the Case for Christ is very crucial if you want to pass this class. You've got to be able to do that. So be reading that. It's a long book, so you want to go ahead and get started on that if you're not already. And then you also have your weekly discussion boards uh, looking at um, two thought-provoking questions as well as um, responding to these discussion boards and that matter. So make sure you go on the um, online. You can find on uh, the class page all these um, assignments where you can upload these things as well. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Until next time, have a good week.